Got a big list today, five most overrated teams after week one. Boomer, what's up, man? Fellas, what's going on? What is Morning. up? Yeah, well, we're officially in it. Like I said, talking season's done and walking season is here. What What are just kind of a few overall thoughts? I know you've been listening before we get into this list after, you know, week one or week two, as I call it. Yeah, I mean, guys, it's just so hard to evaluate some of these teams because they you had some schools that played FCS teams, some teams that played, you know, middle of the road G5 teams, and then you have, you know, Georgia playing Oregon. So, I mean, I think the biggest one for me was was maybe the NC State uh, ECU game. I mean, it's been very known throughout social media that I had NC State in the college football playoff. Um, so, of course, I was getting absolutely roasted on uh, <laughs> Twitter <laughs> on Saturday. But, um, man, that game against ECU was just uh, – it's like we talked about it in one of those Twitter spaces. It's like kicking the hornet's nest when you play one of those smaller uh, in, uh, in-state schools – where it's like their Super Bowl and, you know, you you just want to get through the game and get the win. So um, I, when we talk about this overrated list, I've got NC State on there, but, uh, well, we can talk about it. I think I might replace them with Clemson after last night. Ooh, really? All right, well, let's go ahead and bring up Boomer's list. We, we've got Boomer's list and then we've got ours. So you've got Texas A&M, number one, Haynes King. Didn't look great. If you look at the numbers, they can be somewhat deceiving. Made a few good throws to some wide-open guys, especially when Sam Houston State was in man, which is borderline masochistic. I know that's kind of what they do, but eventually it doesn't need to be what you do when you're getting roasted. But he missed a lot of easy throws. We didn't see Max Johnson. We didn't see Wegman. Offensive line struggled a little bit. Kind mm-hmm. of your overall thoughts on AM. Yeah, no, they, I mean, the, the, the offensive line is what kind of stuffed me because, I mean, it was a young offensive line last year. All those guys returned, and, I mean, they only averaged like 3.4 yards a carry on the ground. Uh, Haynes King had a lot of pressure in the pocket. I, I mean, to me, Texas A&M is not the number five team in the country. Um, I mean, the, the number five team in the country wouldn't struggle with an FCS school, and I think they're going to struggle with App State and Miami. I don't know if they lose, but – I mean, I just, it's the same thing every year with Jimbo. It's like he refuses to uh, evolve his offense. Um, And I think eventually you'll see Max Johnson probably starting at quarterback for them. Yeah, well, it's something I've said. I I think Max Johnson eventually is going to be the guy. Yeah. Speaking about getting roasted, I got roasted when they named Haynes King the starting quarterback. And look, it's early. (laughs) Haynes can can still have a big year. And and like I said, his numbers weren't horrible and he wasn't horrible. But I think AM fans were expecting more. I mean, it was a fist fight with Sam Houston State until, you know, right, right. right before halftime. And then all of a sudden you had the lightning delay. The defense looks really good. AM is really fast on defense. They're very physical, not to the level Clemson is. Uh, but then you had Oregon number two on your list. Uh, Boomer, I don't, I don't think this is crazy. As good as Georgia was, Oregon just looked like when you're, you know, eight years old and your dad gets mad playing one on one in basketball and decides to really show you what's up. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was man against boys in that game. And it was just, I mean, golly, I I mean, Georgia just, maybe they're that good and they would do that to anybody but Bama. But I was just expecting a little bit more uh, competition from Oregon. I mean, Bo Nix looked like a deer in the headlights uh, against that Georgia defense. I mean, now he's what now 0-4 against them. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Ty Thompson is the starter uh, going forward eventually. Um, I just think I... I don't think they wanted to bring Thompson into that situation against that defense and make them and just kind of really scare him, (laughs) scare him off, basically. Um, But, yeah, I I think Oregon, the preseason ranking was a little too high. Yeah, and looking at the Pac-12 now with Oregon going down and Utah going down, USC, you better run the table or you better hope for chaos at the end because I don't see for another year, I don't see a Pac-12 team getting into the playoff. Now, we both agree on this uh, at number three. We actually have Oklahoma State Boomer at number three. I mean, Derek Mason, you know, goes from Vanderbilt then to Auburn where it didn't exactly work out on the defensive side. We both have Oklahoma State, as you can see, at number three. But you give up 44 points to Central Michigan uh, (laughs) coming off a year in where Oklahoma State was defensive heavy and identified as, as a defensive team, per se. Yeah, they had the, I think, the fifth best uh uh, total yard uh, defense against uh, total yards per game last year. Um, mm. So, I mean, we saw, I mean, Ohio State's defense looked tremendously improved against uh, Notre Dame. But, yeah, I mean, they struggled. I mean, guys were just blowing assignments in the secondary. 546 yards allowed against Central Michigan. Yep. 
I mean, they really missed Malcolm Rodriguez at linebacker. You could definitely see that. I'm sure Gundy would probably say the same thing. I just, with the Big 12, you're going to see a lot more improved offenses this year. And the defense just, to me, looked out of sync. I mean, Derek Mason, they showed, like, clips of him. I mean, he looked frustrated up in the booth. So, um, we'll see. I just think, you know, maybe they're a little over overrated this year. Yeah, again, you have to lean on that defense, and and Derek Mason, I bet he was frustrated. It was not a good day for old <laughs> Auburn defensive coordinators with what happened with him and then Gene Chizik at North Carolina. I mean, they were leaking like a sieve. And then Boomer, let's bring Boomer's yeah. list back up uh, here, and, and then we'll hit, hit ours in the periphery. At number four, you've got NC State. At number five, Iowa. Like you said, Boomer, you're, you're high on NC State. I haven't been as high on them because, you know, I, I had to see the offensive line. You can't score again. And look, I know East Carolina's got good players, but they're not nearly what you're going to see compared to what NC State fans and what a lot of people in the media and NC State, they won the game. Sometimes you got to survive those. I get it. But boom, they don't look up front like they have the cats yeah. to be able to compete the way that we thought. And Devin Leary was just okay. Yeah, I mean, he only had like 200 yards, uh, uh, 200 passing yards, and you could tell he really missed Amika Amezi uh, from last year, their lead, their star receiver. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and those goal line situations where they got just absolutely stuffed on a fourth and one, uh, where where the ECU just stopped them. Man, it, it was it was tough. But like I said, it's the in-state rivalry deal. They've lost the last two out of three games going to uh, Greenville, so. You know, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. I have to put them on this list because I feel like it would be too homer of me to leave them off. But, I mean, they got to step it up. Got to improve for sure. And then Iowa, <laughs> I mean, if you guys watch, that was maybe the most entertaining 7-3 to three game I think I've ever watched. If, I mean, spent way too much time watching that game uh, just because how many, I mean, just – the punting, I mean, the offense, uh, the offense is just terrible. And I know people, some people – in the in the college football industry, we're picking them to win the Big Ten West, and I mean, maybe they can with that defense, but but I don't know. It's I I don't see it uh, with that bad of an offense. You scored seven points and didn't score a touchdown. What's wrong <laughs> yeah. with you guys? <laughs> what are y'all doing? It's like, yeah, it's absolutely nuts. It's like the first time I think that's happened since you know like ninth, since football was invented. So somewhat sort of impressive. It, it almost is, and, and you still won the game, but. <laughs> I mean, look, Brian Ferentz, like at some point, I know you're the coach. Did you son, win, though? Did you did win? Did you really win? Did you win? I mean, now you play Iowa State, <laughs> the over-under is 41 and a half. Take the I, under. How do I not take <laughs> Iowa State plus three and a half? I is mean, Iowa going to score over under. three? I mean, what if the game line for the over-under had come out at 10 and a half? Like, would we would have all laughed, right? And then that's what it ended up bidding. <laughs> it would have gotten bet down to nine and a half. <laughs> on the odds, I probably would have took the odds. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go ahead and throw our list up here. Booster Club, get ready uh, to, to ask some questions. Uh, so our list, number one, we had Oregon. Just because, and we have the AP top 25 is what we went off of. So we have the ranking right next to them. So we got Oregon at number 11. Again, we get it. Georgia, absolutely fantastic. Unbelievably deep. But you guys got treated like children that weren't behaving at Universal Studios. You're taking a timeout, maybe get a spanking, and then we're going back up to the room and you're going to think about it. <laughs> no, yeah, it's yeah. one, one of those situations where you just feel like you get to scream into JV for a day. Yeah. And just to do whatever you want. You're, it, it's so easy, you're just trying things. It got to the point where that Georgia-Oregon game in the second half, where Todd Munkin was just trying things. Just to things, get just, stuff on tape. Just to get it on tape and see if it works. That's how <laughs> big the levels of, of, of skill gap was in that game. It's not even close. How you ranked 11? Yeah, and then number two, NC State. We've already talked on them. I've got to see more. I mean, you've got, you know, Charleston Southern next week, so it's so it's not looking like we're, we're going gonna, to uh, gonna know a ton after that one. Week three, let's see who they got right here as I scroll down. You got Texas Tech at home. All right, now I know uh, the Tyler Shug kid got, yep, got hurt. He's going to miss two games, including this one. But the backup came in, and they didn't miss a beat. They went right down the field. I was actually really impressed by Texas Tech's offensive performance. Then Oklahoma State, number three, you can't be a defensive team and get absolutely chippewa by the Chippewas uh, in the fourth quarter. Then Louisville, while they weren't ranked in the AP Top 25, uh, they were getting votes, and a lot of people were saying, watch out for this team, watch out for this team in the ACC. And we watched out. And then y'all got knocked out by Syracuse, who, look, loves Sean Tucker, NFL back. 
Dino Babers on the hot seat. Happy to see it for him. But Scott Satterfield, a guy who came from App, just and then Eli Drink let, left App after him. Is start that seat's getting a little hot, Boomer? Don't you think? Yeah, no, I mean, that game was probably maybe the biggest shocker to me because, I mean, I think Louisville had won the last three games by like 30 points or more. And I, I, I mean, I thought that Louisville would cover. I think they were a four point favorite. And just to go into the carrier dome and just get absolutely, you know, blown, blown out, yeah. it was, it was shocking. I, I mean, I don't know. I, if I'm Scott Siderfield, I'm a little concerned right now about Ooh, my cool. job security. Yeah. Yeah. The seat warmer's on in the car. That seat's getting hot. Also, uh, uh, Syracuse did lose their their big time tight end or a guy that's kind of like their Swiss yeah. Army knife at tight end and one of their best linebackers. So keep that in mind if you're going to be betting on Syracuse. It's so hard to find tight tight ends that are legitimate and linebackers that are legitimate. Let alone losing two of them, they almost marry each other on offense and defense. So that's going to be tough. And then fifth boom, we have Utah. Not that we think Utah's okay. a bad team. I said I thought they were going to lose. You don't just go down to the swamp and walk away uh, with the win. No, you don't go down. When you come down the dirty, sometimes you don't walk away clean, David. I'll continue to say it. Still think they're a good team. I still got them winning uh, the Pac-12. But being number seven, top 10 team, you went on the road against a team that was unranked, uh, got beat. Anthony Richardson, 100% witch alien. Yeah. I mean, they, I, God, that game, I mean, uh, we talked about it last week. I mean, went right down to the wire. I don't know why they were throwing the ball uh, right down by the goal line at the end of the game, but. Gosh, it just it. Why does the Pac-12? It seems like do this where they schedule these games, first games of the week against the an SEC school. It's most of the time on the road, and it's like week one. We're already talking about the Pac-12 being out of the college football playoff um, because Florida. You know, we uh, we've all kind of said they're kind of a middle of the road SEC school. So I don't know. It was frustrating for me to see because Utah should have won that game. In my opinion, they just blew it on that goal line play. Well, it always feels like the Pac-12 has to prove something, right? They, they have to. They're out west. Well, the Pac-12 is this easy schedule, easy conference. And always some teams that have to come down here and feel like proving something. And what they prove is that you just come down here and get beat by middle of the run teams in the SEC, even if you're ranked seventh. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's again, it it just means more. Do you see the crowd at the UCLA game? I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. it, there was like twelve people there. Like there are dozens of us. Doesn't it just means less? It's just the truth, and that over time, that that's what happens. Players want to go play where people want to watch them, and they're the most excited about watching them do their craft. And right now, that's not in the Pac-12. That's why everybody's hoping Lincoln Riley can keep all these West Coast kids that have been leaving to go play at the Bamas, at the Georgias, at the Floridas, at the LSU's. I mean, hell, even going to Texas and keeping them home so they can compete at the level where they want to compete at. Because right now, it's not just the, the civilian population that's leaving California. It's the athletes as well. All right, hey, if you like what you heard, go ahead and ring that bell. Turn those notifications on. We're bringing it every day daily from 2 to 3 Central, and we want you here. I can hear it ringing now.